and welcome to Something's Off with Andrew Heaton. I'm your host, Andrew Heaton, and I'm in Washington, D.C. right now. But don't tell my creditors that. In fact, if anybody asks, tell them I've been at your house the last two or three weeks. Also, if you could loan me a couple hundred dollars and a suitcase, that would be great. Just be cool, man. Be cool. We're going to talk today about one of the sexiest, hottest, orgasmiest topics around, and that is campaign finance. You're welcome. We spent a little over $5 billion on the 2018 midterms, which sounds like a mind-boggling amount until you realize that's about half of what we spent on Halloween costumes, candy, and decorations. But regardless of how you feel about candy corn, and I'm against it, there's a persistent idea that in America, money buys elections and therefore rich people do. That wasn't the case with verified rich guy Mitt Romney or other verified rich guy Steve Forbes or Newt Gingrich, who is not himself super rich, but was backed by a billionaire gambling degenerate in Vegas. Nor did the equation work out for Hillary Clinton, who outspent Donald Trump in 2016. In fact, Donald Trump significantly underspent his Republican primary opponents in 2016 at every step of the campaign. I was working in cable television news then, and I could watch him do it in real time. Whenever he dipped in the polls, he would say something crazy or offensive or both. We should nuke Cuba or charge Rosie O'Donnell with war crimes or ban sombreros or some other nutball thing with vague but unsettling racist overtones. And we in the media would go, holy crap, what did that game show host just say? Let's talk about that guy for the next 18 hours. And thus Donald Trump, quite shrewdly, got an estimated $5 billion in free, unearned media. If in the future we significantly restrict campaign donations, I think we'll get more jackassery of all stripes, because jackasses are better at capturing media attention than policy wonks or garden variety politicians. And while that would be really fun for late night comedy, it would also be terrible for my blood pressure. But it might not even come to that, because so far most of the campaign finance reform we've attempted hasn't actually fixed anything, it's just shuffled boundaries. In 2002, we passed the McCain-Feingold Act, which was meant to limit the power of soft money in politics, shorten races, fix gutters, improve gas mileage, and a host of other problems. But it didn't actually stop anybody from donating money to political causes. It just shifted donations to political action committees. Previously, a candidate could, at least in theory, run a clean campaign. Now enough political activity happens outside of official campaigns that candidates can't stop mudslinging even if they want to. Make a better maze, get smarter rats. Now, there are some places where I would very much support campaign finance reform, but they're internal to Congress and the two big parties and not to you and me. In Congress, the best committees and the most delicious chairmanships are tethered to how much fundraising you do for your party, which means, in effect, that members of Congress get elected to fundraise instead of solve problems. Congress could institute an ethics rule forbidding steering committees from taking fundraising into account on parceling out those sweet, sweet assignments, and then hopefully outlaw candy corn, which is awful. But you know what's not awful? This week's sponsor. Let me ask you something. Do you like pizza? I'm sure you do. I can't think of anything people agree more on than how delicious a hot, cheesy pizza is. But let me ask you a follow-up question. Do you consider yourself to be well-informed? If you listen to this program, I imagine you do. Then you're going to love Headline Pizzas. The only pizza service that gives you a delicious, piping hot pizza every morning and writes the day's most pertinent headlines on it with a Sharpie. Obviously, if you can get your news and your pizza at the same time, it's a win for productivity. That's starting your day right. But in a way, isn't it also a win for a bygone era? I had a pizza route when I was in high school, and while I didn't particularly enjoy waking up at the crack of dawn, there was a great sense of accomplishment, pedaling my bike through the neighborhood flinging pizzas onto everyone's front porch. I don't think I ever managed to successfully land a pepperoni pizza on old man Smitty's porch. And later, he was arrested for killing a drifter. But overall, I feel that pizza boys are a fairly wholesome, all-American way to get your pizza in the morning. And with headline pizza, also the news. Now, maybe it's my imagination. But when I was a kid, I seem to recall that every day in the Heaton household, things began when Dad put on a pot of coffee and sat down at the dining table to open up the pizza and see what was happening in the world. Between news going electronic and milkmen going extinct, you don't see a lot of news pizza anymore. Until now. Get your food and get your news from Headline Pizza. It's news with pizza in it. (laughs) 
And now before I bring on my guest, it's time for a day in the life of Bill Weld. Seven o'clock, wake up, have a practical breakfast of grape nuts with orange juice and two slices of turkey bacon. Read full issue of The Economist to be informed and prepared for the queries and travails of the day. 8.30, take a brisk constitutional around the neighborhood. Say good day and good morning to fellow citizens as they pass by. No one says hello back. Odd. 9.30, time for an interview at NBC. Try to hail a cab. Not a single cab stops. Curious. 10 o'clock, short on time now. Run to the light rail, just making the train on time. 10.20, continually move around as fellow commuters bump into you, step on your feet, and all around do not appear to notice that you are standing there. 11 o'clock, arrive at NBC, walk up to the front desk and say, Hello, Governor Bill Weld here, to see Dan Rather. The desk attendant stares forward, blankly. See here, I don't know what your politics are, but I demand some basic civility. The desk attendant pulls out his phone and starts playing Candy Crush. Walk right past the security guards, who also do not see you, and into the green room. 11.15. Calm down with a cup of coffee. Black. Read some headlines in the Atlantic. 11.20. Time for interview with Dan Rather. 11.30. Try to say something, anything, without the other panelists stepping all over you. Hey, hello. Good point, but uh, wait a minute. Now see here. Listen, if I could just, uh, as I see it. 11.35. Commercial break. 11.40. Stand directly in front of the television camera and start yelling, Hear me! Trump didn't collude with the Russians, but he openly welcomed their interference in the election. And then he attempted to cover it up, which is obstruction of justice, which is less than what we ousted Nixon for. The panelists are talking about whether or not Meghan Markle's baby has solved race relations. 11.45. This is getting weird. Time to bring out the big guns. Pull your shoulders back. Look directly into the camera and recite Queen Elizabeth's speech to the troops at Tilsbury. At its conclusion, look gravely into the camera and extel fellow Republicans to champion character and ideals over bombast and rancor. The panelists are oblivious. They are arguing about what Tom Brady said, about what Donald Trump tweeted, about Kim Kardashian's Instagram post regarding Meghan Markle's baby getting a cameo in the last episode of Game of Thrones. And that's when it hits you. None of these people can see you. Stand in front of Dan Rather. Snap your fingers in his face. Clap your hands together. Yell memorized paragraphs of the Federalist letters into his lav mic to no avail. Hello? Hello? Exit the studio and go back to the lobby. Notice a nervous little boy clearly making eye contact with you. You there, young lad. You can see me? The kid nods gravely. I see dead people. Kneel down in front of him. How can I achieve egress from this tortured limbo? The kid slowly shakes his head. I don't know. I don't know what any of those words mean. But I think you have unresolved business. How old are you? Seventeen and a half? Will you be eighteen by the primaries? <laughs> yes. Nod gravely. Wait. Wait for six months until the Massachusetts Republican primaries. Then enter the voting booth with a kid. It's fine, no one can see you. With a curtain drawn, point to your name on the ballot. That one, you whisper. The kid nods, fills in the little bubble with his number two pencil. Republican presidential primary, Bill Weld. Once the bubble's filled in, begin to dissolve and drift away from this plane of existence. As the child and voting precinct fade into blinding white light, see the ghost of Barry Goldwater and George H.W. Bush come to take you to Valhalla. My guest today, Mr. Dave Leventhal. He is the federal politics editor and senior reporter at the Center for Public Integrity and a devoted son of Buffalo, New York. 
Dave, you sat through a bunch. Thanks for doing that. There was a, a, a Bill Weld sketch, and uh, you, you got to see our, our sponsor this week, so I appreciate your patience. I, I could only wish I was a pizza delivery boy when, you know, when I was delivering the Buffalo News. Yeah, yeah. It's Well, uh, how, how edible was the news? Uh, pretty uh, pretty edible. That's, I mean, it, it was okay. a rough time in the 80s in Buffalo. We, we had to eat whatever nutrition we could get. Well, I, I Hopefully, they'll be able to, to eventually stagger forth to a pizza. Uh, so you know way more about campaign financing and about ethics than I do or probably ever will. <laughs> When, when, I, when I did my uh, pithy tirade at the beginning of the show, was there anything that you took issue with? Uh, I, I, took, uh, I took issue with the statement that, uh, that, that this is uh, in an uncharacteristically uh, expensive election. It is beyond an uncharacteristically expensive election that we're just about to go into. Okay. And we just had an incredibly expensive one. It's going to be incredibly expensive going forward. But really, in 2020, we're, we're going to have something that we quite literally have never seen before or even could have dreamt up even a few years maybe, ago. Maybe we're moving to an election-based economy where all of our economic activity is ultimately going to be stimulated through political campaigns. Well, you, you joke, but this is uh, this is incredible business for yeah. certain segments of the economy, not the least of which is uh, the mass media. It is. And like one of the things that actually kind of stupefies me is I, I was one of many, many people who didn't see Donald Trump winning. Like I, I did not think that was going to happen. I thought I was going to be in bed by like 8 p.m. on the election day. And then he, he won... And now we're also we're still giving money to all the pollsters and all the political uh, political uh, strategists. And I'm like, but didn't we just discover that these people don't know what they're talking about? Like particularly the political strategists. Like I'm like, ah, but yeah, but there's a lot of money to be made right there. And, and you touched on it about the notion that hey, traditionally we expected that the guy or the woman with the most money would win the political election, whether it's a presidency, Congress. Mm -hmm. Governor, dog catcher, whatever it yeah. is, and and that generally is true. Uh, in fact, about eighty-five percent of the time, roughly speaking, in federal races, the candidate with the most money does win the mm -hmm. election. Uh, Donald Trump was a lot different. Well, why was Donald Trump different? You were right. He didn't have as much money as many of the other candidates. He spent a lot less than Hillary Clinton spent. So why did Donald Trump win the presidency? I, I think unearned media attention is a big part of that. I mean, I think it's a lot of different things. But insofar as, as uh, campaigning and finance went, I think it's unearned media attention. I mean, we're, we're about the same age. Let, let's think about growing up. Who, who did we see as sort of the epitome, the personification of the big businessman in this country? It, it was Donald Trump. He was showing up everywhere. He was at WrestleMania. He was running bike races. He was on the cover of magazines. He was on television all the time. And pretty much for the drum he was Home Alone of, too. He was. Yeah. And for the drumbeat of the next 30 years, nothing really changed. Donald Trump has always been in the public consciousness. So the fact that he ran for president, he didn't have to do the same types of things that so many candidates running for president do. The things that right now uh, people like Steve Bullock or Wayne Messam or Marianne Williamson, people who are running for president as we speak right now, but have about, uh, you know, not negative name recognition, but not a whole lot. Uh, Donald Trump didn't have to worry about that, and he didn't have to buy notoriety. He mm. didn't have to buy name recognition because he already had it. Donald Trump was effectively a universally known commodity in the United States uh, and, to some extent, beyond. So all that money that candidates typically have to spend in order to boost themselves, in order to, to get known, in order to put out their policies and just didn't have to to play that game. And and that was sort of a, a singular experience for U.S. presidential politics in that you had a candidate who was like Donald Trump. We've never had a candidate like him before. See, I, th I think, though, that we're going to see a lot more of candidates doing odd things to get media attention. Like, like point point to you, like he, he did have uh, name recognition going into it. Uh, but he would do these kind of outlandish things whenever he dipped in the polls, and then he'd immediately get media attention again. And I, I think people are taking note of that. And so uh, there was um, there was a, a, a campaign in Virginia, I guess for the uh, for the midterm elections, of this candidate singing just horrendously bad karaoke style um, uh, campaign. It was like a parody of, of Top Gun, where they sing. Uh, um, they, they sing and, and 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 he's he's singing it to his uh, a campaign. It was very cringeworthy, and I watched that and I was like, "This is brilliant. This is brilliant because it's so bad. It's going to get media attention everywhere." And like the following day, it was on the Colbert Report, uh, and I, and I went, "That's I think that's where we're headed. Is we're going to see a lot more outlandish things happen that will appear to be um, buffoonery, but will probably be the way to get ahead." Well, take 
Kirsten Gillibrand, senator from New York. Nobody's talking about her a whole lot in the presidential race. Her poll numbers are absolutely in the toilet. Uh, she, in this field of 22 Democratic candidates, is pretty much at the bottom of the barrel right now. What's she been doing lately? She's been playing beer pong in order to try to get enough donations to qualify that for does make the me like Democratic her more. I gotta say that, that actually does make me like her more. Well, you've kind of proved your point uh, in, in the sense that candidates, especially in such a hyper-competitive field right now where everyone is vying for uh, a limited pool of dollars, uh, let's be honest. Uh, they're, they're trying to stand out from the crowd. How do you do that? Well, sometimes you're going to have to do things that uh, are a little bit uh, against tradition or, or away from the norm, and we've already seen that already. I would play beer pong if I were running for president. Uh, what So I, I feel like there, there, there does tend to be a lot of uh, anger about um, you know money and politics and that kind of thing. What do you find people are usually mad about, and what do you think they ought to be mad about? Uh, I think what we've found over the past couple of years is people are particularly upset uh, at two things. Number one, the notion that you can have, uh, you can be very, very wealthy, very, very rich, and go in and spend as much money as you want to effectively to influence the trajectory of a political campaign. So if you have a million dollars or $10 million or $100 million for that matter, and you decide, okay. I'm going to try to elect a particular candidate or I'm going to support a particular party. Basically, the law of the land right now, especially ever since the Supreme Court's Citizens United decision back in 2010, will give you a vehicle to do that. And the most popular vehicle are these groups called super PACs, mm. which in short are groups that can raise and spend unlimited amounts of money and they can go and advocate for or against a political candidate. Now, they can't give that money directly to a political candidate, but they can go up on television, they can buy a million and one Facebook ads or do anything effectively that they want to in order to either support you as a candidate or uh, beat the living heck out of your opponent, which oftentimes is the way that they go. Now, there's another thing, too, called dark money. Ah, uh, yeah, because okay? I'm not really sure. It sounds terrible, but I'm right, not so really sure what it is. Very evil, money. spooky. Dark, you know, dark, dark money, dark money. soft money. But dark money, yeah, let's start with that. Well, dark, dark money is a particular it's brand money of money. that astronomers can't see, and we know that there has to be a lot of dark money to balance out the, the regular... I'm, I'm confused. But just, just like yeah. that picture of the black hole that came out a few weeks ago, you, you can kind of see, like, the swirl okay. of light around yeah. the, the, the dark core. Well, dark money, you know, we know it exists because it gets spent. But we don't know necessarily who is giving the dark money in the first place in order to try to influence a political election. So you have these uh, particular groups. Sometimes they're super PACs. Sometimes they're nonprofit organizations, not the American Red Cross or some charity that's trying to yeah, cure cancer. Red Cross interfering with our politics right. <laughs> again. Stick to ringing those bells, Red Cross. Well, these are particular types of nonprofits uh, called social welfare nonprofits, sometimes business leagues too, like the Chamber of Commerce, mm -hmm. that can accept unlimited donations and they can at least uh, allot a portion of that money that they're raising to politics, to electoral politics. Although, to, to be clear, they're not giving money to a campaign. They're, yep. they're running, like, if, if I were doing this, I, I believe, what, what say I form a, a, a political action committee called Tariffs are Dumb, mm -hmm. or something like that, or a super PAC. Um, what I'm doing is, is sort of within a legal framework, I'm, I'm attempting to educate people on tariffs, but then I'm also going, by the way, this candidate's terrible on tariffs, right? Right. So you're not necessarily endorsing a, a candidate so much as you're just, you can mudsling at them. But uh, now under the law, you can't actually take that extra step and say, hey, you, you're a terrible candidate or you're, you're terrible on this issue. And also, too, you're a terrible candidate and you shouldn't be elected. So certain types of nonprofit groups can use unlimited amounts of money to go ahead and do direct electioneering that is directly in the context of a political campaign that's different than what we had prior to the Citizens United decision. And that's what makes uh, the Citizens United decision so powerful, much to the chagrin of many liberals and many Democrats, and uh, much to the glee of, of many Republicans. Uh, but it's also you know, important to note, too, that both sides use this. The game is what the game is. Democrats love to have just a sort of, you know, just unlimited outrage at the unlimited money. But the truth of the matter is we found evidence of quite literally hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of secret money, dark money, call it what you will, that Democrats over the years have used, injected directly into the political campaign. And we can't sit here and tell you exactly where all that money came from. It could Wait be, a minute, you're no. telling me the Democratic Party has an element of 
hyperbolic outrage paired with hypocrisy? It, it, may, come, it may come as a shock. Uh, but the, the truth is that although Democrats so often want to say or do say, hey, Citizens United, it should be abolished. Uh, there should be a constitutional amendment against it. We should get rid of big money in politics all the time. They're playing the game uh, as well as the Republicans in many regards. And in some regards, they're doing a better job. Yeah, of if, it. if I could, if, if I'm going to be getting the same amount of money, I'd rather appear to be on the, the team, uh, team little guy uh, than team big guy. That's just better marketing and better branding. But before we move forward, I just want to make sure that I understand. So dark money is, is large amounts of money that are going towards a particular political cause, but we don't quite know who's the, the original source of it. So we don't know who the donors are. We don't know who the organization is. If I'm the donor and you're the group that's getting dark money, I'm giving you that dark money, but ultimately the people out there who are the recipients of the message that you're going to put out about a political candidate or a political party, they're not going to know that ultimately I had given that money to you. That's what dark money is. So that that sounds nefarious, but at the same time, I'm kind of I kind of get why people would do that, though. In that now I'm I'm you know now doing a show, and so my opinions are kind of out there. But if I were if I were a civilian and I and I weren't in political media, I don't know that I'd want my name attached to things because ten years from now the the climate might change, and all of a sudden something that I donated money to fifteen years ago is all of a sudden the most horrific thing that's ever existed, even if I've changed my mind. And now I'm going to be you know run out sure. of town on a rail. So I, I kind of get why people would want to keep things anonymous. And, and it's a very compelling argument that, that, that a lot of libertarians have made, a lot of conservatives have made. It's like, look, we, we have a long history in this country of anonymous speech in politics. Go back to Benjamin Franklin. Go back to the Federalist Papers. And oftentimes we'll cite a whole variety of different things that would indicate, very truthfully, that anonymous speech has been something that uh, has been revered in, in certain ways in this country. And the argument basically is, well, okay, if that was all right, why is this wrong? Why is it why is it wrong if, if you want to give money and put it into politics and just want to be in the background? Why, why do we need to know that this person over there, even though they're wealthy, uh, why can't they have the ability to speak the way that they want to, even if it's by using money as a means to the end of conveying a message? Uh, now, the flip side of that, of course, is uh, even something that uh, Antonin Scalia, the former Supreme Court justice, had advocated for and in a slightly different regard, saying, well, you need a certain amount of civic courage when you go forward mm. and spend money in politics or want to engage in the political forum. If you want to convey a message, if you want to speak, whether it's using your voice or using money, then you should put your name behind it. You should be able to stand behind what it is that you say. And many Democrats and many liberals will kind of seize on that and say, well, yeah, that that's the problem here. If you're trying to influence a presidential election, and how do we know that you have altruistic purposes? How do we know that you're not a Russian agent? How do you know? How do we know that you're I'm, not somebody? I'm not convinced that I'm not a bot. I think I might be. Like I think I watched Blade Runner the other day. It's entirely possible. Uh, I that's a fair point, and I, I'll, I'll I'll concede from a policy perspective. A lot of the uh, a lot of the ways to regulate this are usually focused on on protecting the an anonymity of lesser donors. So like I've seen proposals to cap it at like $200 or something where you can be anonymous for up to $200 or something like that. So that if if you are a Sheldon Adelson or someone like that right. that's got, you know, up to $30 million you're going to drop in a campaign, um, you're going to be public about that, but the average person might not be. And th there's, there's something to that. I, I think with that, I don't think that there's a, a way to, to knock it out of the park um, because what you're ultimately doing with, with a lot of these issues is you're, you're picking which value is going to be supreme among, amidst competing values. So I'd say, like, I don't like the idea of rich people buying the election. I don't, I'm not going to concede that I think that's what happens. Uh, but you do have a, an outsource or a, a larger ability to influence an election if you've got a lot of money, right, because you've got a bigger bullhorn for, through which to yell. At the same time, though, I, would, I am more on the side of free speech than I am on attempting to regulate and box all that kind of stuff. Uh, I, I'm more worried about erosion of free speech, which brings us back to Citizens United. Can you kind of walk us through what that was? Because the, the term gets thrown out a lot, and I, I think if you hear it in conversation, it's usually used as the Supreme Court decided rich people can buy elections. And I, I feel like that's not, it's giving it shri short shrift in terms of what actually happened. Well, you have to go back a couple of years before the decision was even decided, which again was in 2010. Uh, Citizens United was actually about a movie involving yeah. Hillary like Clinton. Like a documentary, wasn't it? Exactly. And uh, without getting into all the legal details of it, uh, basically there was this group, Citizens United, uh, which is still very much uh, in existence today. They still hate Hillary Clinton. Just, <laughs> every day they wake up and they're like, is she running again? All right, well, it, we're safe for another day. And led by David Bossie, a man who is a very close uh, compatriot with Donald Trump, uh, although they've had a turbulent uh, 
relationship. Most people, like most people close in, in Trump world. With Donald Trump have had very turbulent relations with Donald Trump. Yeah. But basically, the Citizens United wanted to uh, get a ruling that ensured that they would be able to air this movie, uh, to be able to screen this movie about Hillary Clinton, which, of course, as you can imagine, was extremely unflattering, and do so right before a political election and not uh, be subject to rules at the time that uh, were pretty murky as to whether they would have the ability to even do it. And they were making a very free speech, First Amendment style were, were they case here. In, trying to show it in theaters or were they booking like like large tracks of time on, on, on television and, and broadcasting it as like a made for TV movie? Or yeah, they, the... they had they had multiple plans for airing yeah. this, uh, including a couple that you just mentioned. And uh, the idea was to get it out to the widest audience as possible right before the election and a Opponents to that uh, said, well, wait, that's basically a, a political ad uh, and, and it's not a movie. And they said, no, no, no. Uh, in fact, this is something that should be protected under the First Amendment and should not be subject to campaign finance rules or uh, any election law that would suggest that we have to do anything uh, that, that would be short of a full airing of this movie in every form and fashion that, that we see fit. So ultimately, the Supreme Court ruled that, yes, Citizens United had the ability to air this movie, to put this movie out, but at the same time, too, they went well beyond that. It mm -hmm. just wasn't a case about this one particular movie. It was about the ability for just about uh, every different type of entity to engage in political speech. Uh, so the Supreme Court uh, said, okay, if you're a corporation, if you're a labor union, if you're a certain type of nonprofit organization, like the ones we talked about a moment ago, you do have the ability to basically spend money as you see fit to advocate for a politician or against a politician. And that was a definite departure from the way that things had been running up until that point. Right, because I think prior to that, we hadn't really established whether or not your, your freedom of speech at some point stops when you quit exercising it as an individual. Like, I, I believe that was part of the, the ruling was, you, you always have freedom of speech as an individual, uh, but there was kind of a, a, a mindset um, with dissenters on the case that your your freedom of speech uh, stops when you when you enter a political action committee, uh, and when you combine it, it, it becomes something else. You're now doing a, a something. Whereas Scalia would have would have said, no, your your freedom of speech is uh, un. Uh, unaffected by whether or not you're doing it individually or whether you're doing it aggregately. Um, you shouldn't mute that speech either way. And that's where the trope of corporations are people right. uh, have come. Uh, basically, the, uh, the boiled down, the Citizens United decision said that, yes, a, a corporation, a, a grouping of people that is legally a, a, a separate thing from an individual can go ahead and do the same kinds of things effectively, politically speaking, as an individual when it comes to using as much money as he or she wants to to advocate. So it's a difference between uh, a high-ranking executive at Chevron, the oil company, saying, all right, I'm going to put up advertisements worth a million dollars to support a candidate, and Chevron itself pulling out of its treasury to go directly advocate for that candidate. Uh, that's a big difference uh, and one that, as you can see, uh, oftentimes can have a lot more power and a lot more money behind it uh, because of the corporation or the union, for that matter, versus the individual. If, if Citizens United had gone the other way, like I, there's a, a documentary out right now, mm -hmm. I can't remember what it's called, but it's about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and it's very favorable to her. You know, and if, if Citizens United had gone the other way, that would be the kind of thing we'd regulate, right? Where we'd go, well, that's a pro-candidate documentary. So depending on where it is in the election cycle, we'd have to be like, well, you can't, you can't air that on Netflix if it's within six months of an election or something like that. We don't, you know, we don't have that. But am, am I right in thinking that's the kind of thing that would have been curtailed? It it's possible, and you don't know, uh, you know ultimately it would be dependent on the ruling. All I'm asking you to do, Dave, is into an alternate universe in which that didn't happen and then extrapolate from that the policy ramifications that eventually would have been hammered. I thought we were talking about campaign money and not Star Trek here. That's true. Well, you know, the show's always a little bit talking about Star Trek. If you were to see a Venn diagram of listeners of this program, it's this weird, like, there's like Star Trek, Liberty, and then there's this like, sort of nascent agricultural intelligentsia, where I'll get these like really cool missives from like farmers that are reading, uh, you know, the, the, the Alexis de Tocqueville or whatever. Um, so it's always a little bit Star Trek. Um, uh, before I lose complete sight of a couple of questions, uh, what's soft money? We talked about dark money. What's soft money? 
Uh, well, I, I thought you were going, going to go the gold press latinum route here, but soft money. Uh, being Please as explain it, this to me. You <laughs> gold press gold press latinum as the the relevant. I, I'm not going to be able to do that okay. for you, but I can tell you. I'll what do soft it. I'll money repackage is. it after you talk. Okay, very good. Uh, soft money is something that doesn't uh, exist anymore for all oh, intents and purposes. Okay. And you mentioned uh, at the top of the show, McCain Fine Gold. It was this other Supreme Court decision uh, that, or well, it, it, was wasn't bill, Court, that it was a bill. It was a bill that came yeah. down, and then uh, the Supreme Court ultimately uh, decided to erode parts of it uh, in subsequent decisions that it made. But this bill that was passed. And it was led, of course, McCain-Feingold, who's McCain, John McCain. It was a bipartisan bill that George W. Bush ultimately signed and that got rid of what was called soft money, which was this unlimited amount of money that could go to political parties. So right. part of the you know, establishment... You can give to a, an individual or a party. Right. Uh, and not we're not talking but about not super PACs because they didn't you exist still at this give point. all that money to them. Yeah, th right. That's my, my main problem with it is I, I, I understand the intent but I, I, I think with a lot of this stuff, um, make a better maze, you get smarter rats. And uh, with, with that one, people went, all right, so I can still give $20,000 to this political action committee that's not even necessarily run by the candidate. Now we're going to, like, uh, you know, swift boat whoever, even if McCain would be against that. But we, you can't, he's not controlling that anymore. Well, a lot of people, Democrats and Republicans who I talk to, uh, when I ask them the question, I say, well, okay, do you honestly think that you could ever get rid of money in politics, or at least limit it to a point where instead of having five or seven or $10 billion election cycles, we have something that's one or two billion. And a lot of people will say, and again, both on the right and the left, that money in politics, it's sort of like pushing on a waterbed, okay? If you push here and limit it over here, it's gonna squish over there. And if you push over there, it's gonna squish over there. Money will always find its way into the political process. And you know, there's no evidence up to this point, as we're speaking right now, that that isn't true. We can't predict the future and know what'll happen 10, 20 years from now, but from a regulatory standpoint, from a legal standpoint, the arrow has been moving in the direction of the ability for people to spend more money in politics, for the regulations and rules governing money in politics to be stripped away as opposed to being added to. Mm -hmm. So we're we're much more on the laissez-faire end of matters do, right do now. Do you think that's why it's getting, uh, why there's more money in it is because of lack of regulation? Uh, well, it, it definitely contributes to it. Okay. There, there's no question. Uh, if there were stronger regulations, uh, then there would be areas that uh, you just, you know, simply couldn't play in, like the super PAC realm. You might not be able to give that $10 million to a super PAC that in a moment, can turn around in literally in a few hours, could be spending that money uh, without pause. So maybe you regulate there, but money's going to find its way somewhere yeah, else. See, anyway, I, it's very difficult. I, I think, I mean, we're, so we're in D.C. right now, and I believe that we're in what, the top, like the three wealthiest counties in America are all conglomerated right here. It's like, uh, right in Maryland and, and like Alexandria uh, and, and Arlington, and then also over in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Um, I, I think that whenever you've got the government that's allotting trillions and trillions of dollars, you're always going to have people spending money to try and get control of that. So the only the only thing that I think would actually help would be to limit the amount of spending happening, because then there's less of an incentive for people to desperately try and grasp where that money's going. I don't think it's going to happen, but I think if we, if we actually wanted to limit the amount of money going into politics, you have to limit the amount of money politics is spending. And and I would say something similar to that, too. Uh, so, many, so many people focus on the issue of money in and of itself, the actual dollars and cents. Uh, time is a huge issue. And of course, the old adage, time is money. Well, <laughs> you know, in Washington here, politicians who are serving in Congress, again, Democrats and Republicans, they may spend three, four, five hours each and every day dialing for dollars, mm, going yeah. to fundraisers, uh, spending their very limited amount of time uh, in the pursuit of money. So Which does bug me. I'll say like as, yeah. as, a, as a, uh, a constituent and as a taxpayer, uh, I would rather whoever's representing me and my, my fellow neighbors uh, would be problem solving as opposed to fundraising. Now, how, how much of that, like it's, it's my understanding that a lot of that, though, is uh, coming from people that are in a safe seat. But in order to rise within their party, they have to do fundraising. So they're, they're trying to get good chairmanships. They're trying to get good committee assignments. They want to be on the, you know, Singapore Select Committee or whatever the, what the fun golf trip's going to be. Um, or they want to be on the, the Intelligence Committee. They don't want to be on Agriculture, whatever the thing is. Um, to get there, they have to earn a bunch of money for the party. That way, the steering committees for the Republicans and Democrats go, you've done a good job. You've raised $200,000 for the party, so we're going to give you that chairmanship or we're going to give you that assignment. But that, that's, am I right in thinking that is a significant portion of that is the, the kind of inter-party element as opposed to the actual election for the person running? For Congress, absolutely. And if, uh, if you're a member of Congress, there are certain thresholds that you're going to need to meet in order to not only get plum 
positions and, and whatnot, but also too, to get certain support from uh, the party committees uh, that, that are set up to support you when you run for re-election, or for that matter, when you're a first-time candidate, uh, you need to be able to show that you are raising money and that you are a viable candidate, financially speaking, in order to get support from, say, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee or the Republican counterpart to that, and so on and so forth. So money plays a huge role in this. And sure, there are exceptions to the rule where you're going to have a candidate who gets elected and doesn't play that game, okay? Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is probably the shining example on the Democratic side, but for every AOC, there are 10, 20, 30 other candidates who did play the game and did do it the way that the party wanted them to do it, uh, played by the rule book, and uh, also got elected too. So they're definitely the outliers, those folks. So we're, we're going to have to wrap up here in a second. A uh, couple of final questions mm -hmm. for you. What are bundlers? And then so it's at the back of your mind. If you could give a closing thought of like low-hanging fruit that you know both both sides of, of the political spectrum would tend to agree on, is there, is there any step that you would take to try and aid elections or democracy that you think would be would be better managed than it currently is? But before we get into that, what is bundling? Bundling is an act where you are a very wealthy, well-connected person by and large, and you act as sort of a, as a surrogate or an agent for. A political campaign, most notably presidential campaigns. And uh, that's how you get ambassadorships. And that is how you get lots of plum things, mm -hmm. including ambassadorships, but also cabinet positions and uh, perhaps other postings in the administration. These people are in a, in a very usually unofficial capacity, but basically they go out and they say, all right, you know, friend over here, friend over there, I want you to write a big check for Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton or any of the current Democrats running right now, and uh, I'm going to bundle it up in the old days. It would actually be literally in, in a bundle, and they would hand the checks over. Now, of course, it's very digital, but the, the, the premise is still the same, where they're collecting contributions, they're serving as a conduit, they give that money to the candidate, and they benefit that candidate to a great degree. The interesting thing about bundlers is unless you're a federally reg registered lobbyist, which most bundlers are not, we don't, we don't know who you are unless the candidates voluntarily release a list of who their campaign bundlers are. Donald Trump has never done this. Uh, the Center for Public Integrity, we published an article recently, and we asked every single Democrat, are you going to release information on your bundlers? Are you going to tell us who they are and how much they've bundled for you? And it was a total mixed bag. Yeah, I, I read that article that you guys put out, and it was a lot of cricket noises. Like, there were, there were like two campaigns that were like, uh, yes, we are going to release it, and everybody else just didn't respond. So the question is, why should people care about bundlers? Well, they should care about bundlers, and, and you nailed it, uh, because bundlers oftentimes are going to be the people who get some position of power, not because they're really qualified or because they're, they're awesome diplomats or, or really smart political minds, but because they were really good fundraisers. Right, and if you don't believe me on this, I, I don't know who the, the current um, slate of ambassadors is under the, the Trump administration. I haven't followed it as much. And it's also a little bit harder to follow as well because um, with Trump, presumably someone coming from the private sector would want to have private sector people representing him. So it's a little bit harder to delineate between why is that person there. With Obama, we had our ambassador to Hungary was a soap opera producer. Our ambassador to France was also a Hollywood guy. We very nearly had uh, a complete moron as our ambassador to Norway. Uh, I can't remember his name, but he, um, I mean, he, he just, if you go back and watch those, those hearings, he would talk about like the president of Norway. There's no president of Norway. Uh, our, our ambassador to Argentina had never been to Argentina. He didn't speak Spanish, uh, but, uh, but they were all bundling a lot of money. And uh, Hey, look, Barack Obama, we, we did a study and looked at all of his ambassadors. A ton of them were bundlers. So Democrats do this, too. Yeah. Donald Trump. Everybody, this is, goes, this goes back a long way. I want to, yeah, right. to clarify, this is not like a specific candidate or a specific party. It's, it's in my opinion, ripe graft, but it goes back a long way. But Donald Trump has taken it uh, to that level and, and beyond. And you mentioned some of the sort of flashpoints of uh, people who have been big supporters of his campaign. We don't, again, know who all Donald Trump's bundlers are because he doesn't release information. But let's take Kelly Craft. Well, who's Kelly Craft? She's the wife of Joe Craft, the big uh, coal mogul who donated incredible amounts of money to Donald Trump's efforts, uh, also to his inauguration. And she has been the ambassador to Canada, nominated as the UN ambassador. So uh, somebody like that is a sort of uh, exemplary of many of the people who have been put up by Donald Trump. Uh, a guy by the name of Doug Manchester out in California. He's somebody who has been put up as the ambassador to the Bahamas, which he thought that's in the, the That's the sweetest one. Is that whoever the ambassador to the Bahamas is is usually a really good... But he actually said that, that 
the Bahamas were a protectorate of the United States, uh, which, of course, is, well, patently untrue. But, uh, you know, again, this is this is getting back to Meanwhile, the point we're, that we're given the career diplomats that actually get shot at. And like career diplomats, like that's a thing. Like you have to be really smart to do that. Your life is on the line. They usually send you to some hellhole for the first six years of your career where people either believe in communism or magic and they're trying to kill you. And like those guys were like, OK, you get to be ambassador of Kyrgyzstan. Meanwhile, oh, France is a good one. We're going to give France to the, you know, the petroleum executive or bundlers are not getting sent to Chad. I think our, our current um, ambassador to the United Kingdom is like a sports franchise team owner i think he's the guy that owns like the the new york he one of those one of those teams that i don't know sports for i know ambassadors more than i know sports <laughs> but he's like that's his he, he owns a sports team that's our ambassador to britain but for donald trump bundler and uh, in, that's a way that it works. So uh, in, unless uh, Congress decides that there's going to be some other law put in place in order to limit ambassadors or presidential candidates or presidents, once they get elected, decide that we're going to play a different kind of game that we've been playing all along, Democrat and Republican, then I, this, this is, is what, what we've got. Do. I would be fine with that. Just give them friggin' knighthoods. Just that's what we do. <laughs> in, what we do in the UK is just give you the, give these people knighthoods and you let the, the actual civil administrators handle stuff or you give it to some duke. That's the other downside of that system. But I, I would do that just like, okay, you give a ton of money, you want a title for the rest of your life, you get to be sir or dame, whatever, and we'll we'll give the actual diplomats control of the embassy. So we're going to wrap up. Uh, any any final thoughts, any any big idea you want to impart of, of something that might be a good thing to consider with uh, elections moving forward? Well, we haven't talked about the Federal Election Commission, and the Federal Election Commission is uh, set up and created. It's an executive branch agency that uh, is supposed to be there to regulate and to enforce campaign finance laws such as they are in this country. Uh, it's also an agency that uh, has had an incredible amount of turmoil over the past few years. Democrats and Republicans can't really seem to get together to know what to do at all really? about they, this they, agency. They, they, they don't get along well when having a watchdog that governs how they get elected? That nope. surprises me terribly. And they're actually one commissioner away, or losing one commissioner away, from uh, shutting down all of their uh, higher functions uh, mm. in the sense that they would lose a quorum and couldn't even get together and meet and to determine what's anymore? going on. So we could have elections, but we wouldn't have a federal election oh, commission okay. being a cop on the That's beat. That's less enthusiastic. I was about to Something say, not having elections, to. it would be kind of an interesting thing for you. <laughs> uh, well, I will, uh, I'll be happy to nominate you. Uh, you seem like you're on top of stuff, Dave, and I've enjoyed having you on the program. Thank you very much. If nominated, I will not serve. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. Little bit of listener feedback before we wrap up the program. On iTunes, Robert Leary says, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. I listen to your podcast every day at the gym. Your words inspire me with such libertarian pride that I put cigarettes in my rolled up sleeves, march up to my local communist agitator and punch him right in the face. The red, the red scum never sees it coming. However, he may just be our city ginger as my only evidence of him being a commie is that he is literally red. Uh, thank you for that lovely feedback, guy from Omaha, Nebraska, who's apparently smoking and working out at a gym listening to my agitprop before randomly assaulting people of Irish descent. That warmed the cockles of my heart. You can watch this whole show on YouTube. If you look for Something's Off with Andrew Heaton, you can see my handsome bearded face and assortment of suits and the dead bison head that we screwed to the wall. But not here when we're in D.C. It's a whole different setup. It looks like I'm in front of the Capitol, and you don't know unless you're watching me on YouTube. Watching Something's Off with Andrew Heaton on your computer will only make you seem more sophisticated and amusing at your office or prison cell. So go to YouTube and start watching full episodes, I look like what John Lennon could have been if he'd cleaned up his act and gotten his hair cut. Just imagine. Remember, you can always tweet me at Mighty Heaton or Facebook me at facebook.com slash Mighty Heaton or even email me by subscribing to my newsletter at MightyHeaton.com and replying when I send it out or when you get your confirmation letter. Finally, please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. That helps other people discover this here political orphanage. Thank you and good day.